Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker. Kegro in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. It is Thursday, November 29th, 2018. Time for yet another show. Can you believe in 10 years you'll be dating this show? I, I don't know. I'm not sure where we're going to go today. It's uh, chock full of news. We could go in any one of 55 directions, and I think I'm leaving out about, oh, I don't know, uh, the better portion of them. If I said uh, we could talk about, well, uh, the uh, Deutsche Bank raid this morning. That's uh, the latest news, I think. Apparently, uh, the international bank raided on money laundering charges, and I don't, I don't even know which offices they decided to uh, to go through. But if you know anybody that has any interests tied up in Deutsche Bank, let me know. We can probably investigate that, of course. Uh, apparently, it's uh, related to the Panama Papers, so we're going to have to get uh, caught up on that one. Bill reminds me that uh, we have got some other avenues to explore today by tweeting out his Daily Coast Radio is live. Now tweet as he does most mornings. KGROX delivers all the news today that the mainstream media will eventually catch up with months from now. How does he do it? That's the question. The answer is I actually read the mainstream media the first time they report these things. I don't do any of this. It's actually our stupid media who we hate so much. Occasionally does, in fact, do all these things and do them very well. Uh, great credit, I think, to the Miami Herald and the writers there for finding a way to get America interested in this story, which has been out there for quite a long time today. I'm very happy that people are talking about it. They've got a news hook and uh, we're definitely going to want to talk about that for sure. Jeffrey Epstein leading that news. And, uh, of course, we're now beginning to realize not only did Jeffrey Epstein have direct connections to Donald Trump, but the, the big news hook on the story in the Herald, and I think it's a great one, is that, yeah, Alex uh, Acosta, who is currently the labor secretary in Trump's cabinet, was the prosecutor chiefly responsible for engineering the sweetheart deals of all, sweetheart deal of all sweetheart deals for Jeffrey Epstein once he was finally busted for his uh well his pedophile sex trafficking ring and there's really no other way to describe it and it requires no hyperbole to get there that's what everybody says it was that's what he says it was uh but man we got some detail from the herald about the conditions of his imprisonment, if you can even call it that. And, uh, well, that's going to stir a lot of controversy. And that's, and, and, and it's too long to read because it's like a three part th series. Uh, each one probably would take us an hour plus to go through. Anyway, uh, Greg Dworkin also has a raft of stories lined up. I don't even know. There's about 15 other gigantic ones that are almost guaranteed to come up today. And then 15 more that we're just going to have to miss. About, let's say, 11 of which will come up on the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy later on with Justice Putnam. But Greg is here, and Greg has the information uh, also on the, the Deutsche Bank raids. This uh, Strangely enough, it happened in Germany. And, you know, that's kind of where you would think that that bank is. But that basically tells you, uh, yeah, headquarters. They think the whole operation. Frankfurt. Yeah. Must be about uh, money laundering. And Frankfurt, uh, oh, by the way, excellent uh, snacks they have there. Their sausages. People love them around the world. Not sure if they're sandwiches, but we could look into that later on. Well, uh, that's a good question. You know what I'm going to do? <laughs> there's, there's so much to talk about. Yes. But I'm going to talk Are about they sandwiches? some old friends first. Okay. So let's start with old friend uh, David Nair. He, David's not yes. old, but, uh, but he's... Uh, been a friend for a long time. He's the elections director over at Daily Coast. And uh, he had a story that actually, uh, uh, an observation that made it all the way to Rachel Maddow last night. Yes. And he was talking about how the New York Times covers uh, Democratic versus uh, Republican politics. It's really kind of interesting. As you may have did heard, Nancy Pelosi was running for speaker. Yes, I heard about and, that. Uh, she she, she actually me. did quite well yesterday. Yes, uh, I I helped her out a little bit. I didn't. Yeah, and uh, you know she she uh, got votes in the Democratic caucus, and I guess 
uh, you'll help explain this. In the Democratic caucus, some of the non-voting members, like from the territories, get the vote, but they don't necessarily get the vote in the House for the actual speaker yes, vote. Yes, that's right. Uh, well, yeah, it's a it's a thing <laughs> we have with the Constitution. Uh, yeah, the uh, members who aren't from states aren't, uh, I think constitutionally speaking, just not entitled to a vote on the floor since the, the makeup of the Congress uh, is, is pretty clear and spelled out in the, in the Constitution. So if you're not from a state, you're kind of out of luck. Uh, but so, uh, the, under, <clears throat> under our uh, House rules that Democrats like to adopt, they can vote in, in committees – and because uh, that's not the House of Representatives, so that's not described in the Constitution. So other subgroups of the House they can vote in, but Republicans exclude them. Right. But, you know, it's just one of those interesting things. So it's really only a Democratic thing. Pretty much. I suppose if they uh, if there were more Republicans among the delegates, they might allow them to vote. Right. Maybe. So, or if they needed Maybe to vote, they might change the rules and then oh, all yeah, of a sudden right. they could vote because like that happens too, right? Uh, yeah, they could do that. Although I think they'd have a hard time overcoming the constitutional problem if they're from, you know, outside of the the, the states, essentially. Right. So. And just so you know, uh, and this is one of the topics we are going to get to, which is the Mueller investigation. George Stephanopoulos just That's tweeted it, breaking right. news, special report on breaking news in the Mueller investigation oh. imminent. Oh, and that so was Stephanopoulos, that probably not break while we're on the show. So I just thought you should know. OK. So anyway, David uh, pointed too. out that uh, uh, that the Nancy Pelosi uh, did quite well. But that's not how The New York Times covered it. When oh. Paul Ryan was elected speaker, the mm -hmm. story was Republicans nominate Paul Ryan as House Speaker. And he was he won the overwhelming support of his colleagues in the nominating contest is now set to be installed as speaker in a formal vote. Republicans said the vote was 200 to 43 over Representative Daniel Webster, Mr. Ryan's closest rival. So at the time, he got 200 votes. He got 43 against. It was actually somebody running against him, and uh, he was overwhelmingly elected. The way the Times originally wrote up yesterday was Democrats nominate Pelosi to be speaker, but with significant defections. Oh, I see. And she handily won, but with 32 Democrats voting no, well short of the number she'll need to reclaim the gavel in January. And you see the difference in how they were covered. <laughs> yes. She had nobody running against her. It's not likely that she's going to be denied the gavel. And in fact, uh, David pointed this out. It was kind of uh, we, we, we cover Democrats different than Republicans. And then the mm -hmm. Times changed it. Uh, after that and said Democrats resoundingly nominate Pelosi as speaker, but defection signal fight ahead. And that was a little bit different than the original, but that's how it rolls. That's how they yeah. do it. Uh, well, yes. <clears throat> and I see this, <clears throat> pardon me, this is going to take me about 15 minutes to get over this. I, I see this morning uh, that the, the New York Times has changed their story. Is that what happened? I, I, well, they, they rewrote it. They rewrote it. Okay. So now they've come, it says, I, I see your tweet here or the one you grabbed from David. They've completely changed its, is it, did they change their story or they changed their approach? No, they changed, they changed their approach. Oh, okay. I mean, they, they often will do that. There are some uh, uh, websites and uh, uh, Twitter accounts. Okay. Yes, I see. That uh, they keep track of changes. I got you. Yeah. So now they're and so, so now now they're a little bit more in line. It, okay. it really was a resounding victory, and that's how it should be presented. Yeah. But uh, that's one okay. of the things that was out there. Another thing that was out there is Man, uh, out there. Yeah. the California twenty one election, and all of the votes are in from the Republican areas. Okay, and the only one outstanding is the big Democratic area. Uh, and uh, there's still a 500 some odd vote lead, and oh. therefore the, uh, the Democrat running in California 21 is declared victory. We'll see if uh, AP actually catches up to that. And then the third uh, piece that we have to just uh, up to date in terms of elections actually was the story that we were talking about yesterday that North Carolina 9 <laughs> was not mm -hmm. certified because of irregularities. Okay, yes. We didn't know what the irregularities were, but now we do. The board is investigating potential absentee ballot irregularities in the 9th Congressional District. The Republican won by about 400-some-odd votes. 
But it turns out board members unanimously voted to certify final tallies in all the elections held earlier, but didn't sign off on that one. And uh, actually, uh, uh, Dan McCready, the Democrat, trails by 905 votes. But apparently the problem is that there's an awful lot of absentee ballots. Okay. Like, and they're trying to figure out why there are so many absentee ballots. Oh. Mm, I don't know. Did... Okay. Uh, so, oh, and it's yes. from this one county. And again, you will remember that uh, somebody uh, had complained that they seem to do this all the time. So the question oh. is, are absentee ballots somehow appearing that are changing mm. the election results? That's really, well. I guess, the issue. Elections officials concern, uh, confirmed Wednesday that an election investigator sees completed absentee ballot request forms and absentee container envelopes November 7th, the day after the election. Steve Stone, chair of the Robeson County Board of Elections, said state investigators had requested information the county board kept on an unusual number of absentee ballot requests. Stone said county election officials began keeping logs of who dropped off large numbers of registration forms and absentee ballot requests and later reported the concerns to the state board in August. Mm-hmm. Stone said county residents had reported that people were going to door to door telling voters the registrations had been dropped. They needed to re-register and they were asked to sign an absentee ballot request form. Uh, OK. And so they, that's... They, they were knocking on doors and saying, oh, you're not registered. You're... Re-register, sign here. We'll do your absentee ballot for you. OK. So uh, no, no real idea whether they were registered or not. They just said it so that they would start signing things. And I guess if you're registered and you – what happens if, you, if you're registered and you sign a new registration form, I guess nothing happens. But yeah, you, I'm not but, sure exactly where this goes, but the but whole then you get the process of how they're doing the election didn't feel right, as they like yeah. to say. Did the, so that's really what the issue is. I don't know that that changes the results or invalidates the results or what happens at this point, but that's the issue. Since we yeah. brought it up on the show yesterday – Thought right. we'd do a little follow-up. There. Yeah, well, we're going to have to do some more at some point. I'd be real interested to know. Uh, yeah, it's a story. All those continue. people. Well, yeah, I wonder if those uh, if those absentee ballots didn't go to the addresses that the people are registered at. That would be super interesting. Right. So here's apparently the uh, Mueller stuff that's breaking. Michael Cohen told lawmakers last year, in sworn testimony, he huh. didn't know whether Donald Trump had foreknowledge of the 2016 Trump Tower meeting with Russians. Okay, he did, but yeah. But now he says he lied. <laughs> oh, well. So Michael you, Cohen is you, you guilty that? to lying to congressional committees investigating Trump collusion, sources tell ABC News. Wow. So if that's what he lied about, that's bad. But, of course, we don't know the details. Okay. Yeah, is that a tweet you found somewhere? You can yeah. pass that on. I'll, I'll include that in our roundup. Okay, oh, so okay. he's <laughs> saying he's lying about... His prior testimony to Congress, was that right? About, uh, well, I'll read it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, So this is from Andrew Prokop. Thanks, Andrew. uh, There is Ah, the tweet. Very good. Excellent. And uh, Cohen has spent 70 hours talking with prosecutors from special counsel Robert Mueller's office. That's That's a lot of time. Yeah. And this one is from ABC News, which is reporting the breaking news. So let's look a little bit about Mueller. And uh, we have another old friend here to bring up. All right. That is uh, Marcy Wheeler. All right. And uh, once upon a time, uh, David, and this is not to take credit for her work. She did it, not us. But uh, David – and I, oh, yes, and a bunch of other friends, and Marcy used to blog together at this thing called the Next Tara that was back in like 2007. Yes, Next Tara. So right. That's that's where you know I mostly met Marcy. That's the platform she used to write her book, Anatomy of Deceit, which is about the Scooter Libby uh, extravaganza travesty. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, but Marcy uh, is a very solid reporter. With right. an eidetic memory for details. And uh, she has a nice piece in uh, the Huffington Post as a guest uh, writer. Paul Manafort's oh. nonstop lying may have done Robert Mueller a huge favor. <laughs> okay. Right? After lying to the IRS and lying to banks and then asking witnesses to lie to the government, 
former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort also lied to prosecutors. You know, there's a lot of liars that are associated with Donald Trump. I don't know if you noticed that. Also lied to prosecutors when he was supposed to be cooperating as part of a plea deal. And that's some of the stuff we talked about yesterday. In a status report presented in the former Trump campaign manager's criminal case, Mueller's team asserted, in spite of a plea deal, promising to cooperate truthfully and forthrightly, he didn't. Huh. Okay. Monday's status report promises that the special prosecutor's office yes. will substantiate its claim that Manafort violated his plea agreement with a detailed sentencing submission that sets forth the nature of the defendant's crimes and lies, including those after signing the plea agreement herein. So, as part of the normal sentencing process, Mueller will provide details to substantiate his claim that Manafort lied to the prosecution team and possibly evidence of other crimes committed before he entered into the plea agreement. Hmm. Why is that important? Because we have this guy, Matthew Whitaker, who is now the acting attorney general. No, he's not. And when Mueller's done, he's supposed to submit a report confidentially to Whitaker, and then I guess Whitaker decides whether or not to pass it along to Congress, bury it, or do whatever. Uh, And in theory, Matthew Whitaker could... Uh, make it so that whatever Mueller does, we never find out. In practice, it could be subpoenaed by the Democratic House, but more to the point, if Mueller uses indictments and listings of what people did wrong to spell out what's going on, you don't need the report. Right. right. That would be one and that, thing. And that's the implication of Marcy's piece here. Okay. And that's why uh, Manafort lying has actually helped Mueller because now he has a vehicle to tell the public what's going on. Yeah, uh, he didn't adhere to the agreement, and so he'll tell the court that. And there's no, there's no place for the uh, purported acting attorney general to intervene. Right. Uh, more information. This comes from the Guardian. And remember, we talked about the Guardian claiming that Stone may have met Assange in London. Right where he's holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy. And the dots there are if Stone or his uh, sidekick, Jerome Corsi, had access to Assange, who had access to the Russians, who Uh. hacked uh, information from John Podesta and the DNC, and then Stone passed that information along to Trump, that's a conspiracy collusion cooperation story. Ah, oh, we've been waiting so for one of those. That, and, and we tried to connect those dots yesterday and say, well, that, that's why if the Guardian story holds up, it's important. Today, the Guardian says Trump advisor sought WikiLeaks emails via Nigel Farage ally. Mueller document alleges. Ted Malak was this allegedly passed request to get advanced copies of emails stolen from Trump's opponents by Russian hackers. Oh. All right. So an ally of Nigel Farage, who was mm-hmm. wound up with the Brexit stuff, yes. was asked to obtain secret information from WikiLeaks for Donald Trump's team during the 2016 election campaign, according to U.S. investigators. The allegation emerged in a draft legal document drawn up by Robert Mueller the special prosecutor investigating Russia's interference in the 2016 election and any collusion with Trump's campaign team. Hmm. In response to a series of questions from The Guardian, including whether he had acted on the request to make contact, Malik said no and no comment. Hmm. Okay. So there's a lot of different things going on here. As Marcy points out, you can get information from Mueller through his indictment publications, and you can also... Look at the uh, London end of things if you're mm-hmm. trying to tie in uh, Julian Assange and the Brits have their own sources that Trump doesn't necessarily control and can't bully. Yes. And the London Guardian people actually are under much tighter uh, libel and, and uh, other laws there compared to the U.S. So if they're publishing this stuff, you got to think there's some substance behind this. Mm, and they're be- using the draft legal document drawn up by Robert Mueller as the basis for their story. Oh. Hey, that's our document. Yeah. Give so, back, you know, it, it's, it, it seems like there's a lot that's going to be coming out, and that may help explain why Trump is on a, a Twitter tirade this morning oh. complaining about the witch hunt. Oh, well, sure. 
Although, you know, also... We don't have to read his tweets, but, you know, just to, last night he went yeah. to bed complaining about it. This morning he's waking up complaining right. about it. I mean, anything could explain him raging on Twitter about a witch hunt. Just the fact that he's right. awake is enough. So, as the Guardian story says, Trump appeared increasingly anxious on Wednesday following the latest burst of activity from the investigation that has clouded his presidency. He claimed without evidence in a tweet that Mueller's team was viciously telling witnesses to lie about facts in return for favorable treatment. <laughs> oh, they what? spell favorable wrong. I'll have to tell them. The latest rel- revelations came as the role of the former Trump campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, has come under greater scrutiny amid reports in the U.S. that Mueller is looking into his meeting with the Ecuadorian president in 2017. On Tuesday, sources also told The Guardian that Manafort met with Assange, an Ecuadorian embassy. It was Manafort that met with Assange, not Stone, according to The Guardian. A claim denied by both men. Uh, Malak 66 has been under scrutiny by Mueller for months amid suggestions he may have served as an important nexus in 2016 between Trump's White House bid and the campaign to secure Britain's exit from the European Union. He was stopped and questioned by the FBI in March upon his arrival at a U.S. airport and said his mobile phone was inspected by investigators. Mueller later subpoenaed him to appear before a grand jury considering the inquiry's findings. Malik, who's American, told the BBC soon after Trump's election win, I've had a lot of contact. I've been involved with the campaign for over a year and a half. And so there's that story. That seems kind of big to me. Yes, I think so. So uh, there's there's that. There's the Michael Cohen piece that just is going to uh, rile up people even more. I mean, what's happening is that uh, Mueller, obviously, who knows a great deal more than we do, pulls all this together. But separately, uh, there just seems to be other sources besides depending upon Matthew Whitaker to get the information that Mueller puts together out there, be it indictments or uh, court documents explaining moves that Mueller's taken or how the British press is going to handle this now that Britain seems to be just as involved. Yeah. Well, uh, the British are taking their own path there, just as we uh, we read the other day that uh, the British Parliament was exercising what amounts to uh, an analog to our Congre- our congressional inherent contempt powers, uh, subpoenaing documents uh, from a uh, a litigant in some Facebook lawsuits that uh, they thought they would uh, get a hold of some good information from, but they were refusing to turn it over. And they they sent the sergeant at arms of the House of Commons to go grab these things up. It was pretty. So you have to put that in context with the Republicans blocking a Mueller protection bill from the Senate floor vote. Yes, well, whether that protection that. bill would actually protect Mueller or not is unclear, but uh-huh. certainly uh, it seems like this stuff's going to come in anyway. It's going to make them look bad, I guess is my point. Yeah, well, I'm for that. Mm. Now, the politics. Uh, this is from Politico. Democrats pressed the case for trump russia collusion. A flurry of new reports. Collusion, of course, has scare quotes around it. Oh. A flurry of new reports has Democrats calling the case for coordination between the 2016 Trump, trump campaign and the Kremlin stronger than ever, and collusion is back. Oh, hey, uh, we're back, baby. At the same time, how does Trump respond? Well, this is the New York Post. Trump threatens to declassify devastating documents about Democrats. Uh-huh. In a wide-ranging exclusive interview with the Post, remember Donald's Playhouse uh, interview yesterday? Yes. Uh, which you looked at a little bit. President Trump said right, Wednesday that, that if House Democrats launched probes into his administration, which uh-huh. he called presidential harassment, they'd pay a heavy price. <laughs> If they go down harassment. the presidential harassment track, if they want to go and harass the president, <laughs> yes. I think that would be the best thing that would happen to me. I'm a counterpuncher. I will hit them so hard they've never been hit like that. Because <laughs> right. like in politics, nobody's ever tried to uh, you know, hit the Democrats. No, it's, it's never happened before. Rare this thing. will be the first time. We'll have to see if they can take a punch. Yeah, it'll be pretty interesting. Uh, so he's going to selectively declassify documents to do political damage to the opposition party who is taking over the investigative power in the House of Representatives where impeachment starts. Okay. It's, you know, okay. It's, but, it's, but, but this is where it gets, you know, uh, flights of fantasy. Hmm. The commander in chief said he could declassify hmm. FISA warrant applications and other documents from Robert Mullins probe 
and predicted the disclosure would expose the FBI, the Justice Department, and the Clinton campaign as being in cahoots to set him up. I think yeah. he's been watching a little bit too much Judge Janine here. Yeah, I think exactly. that would help my campaign. If they want to play tough, I will campaign. do it. All right. They will see how devastating these pages are. So he thinks this is a campaign. He right. thinks he could use FISA warrants, the Justice Department, and the apparatus of the federal government to attack his enemies. But he's not yes. going to do it just yet. Trump told the Post he wanted to save the documents until they were needed. Oh, yeah, right, sure. Okay, well, that's all fine and dandy. I certainly wouldn't mind seeing some of the documents. I think he's made threats like this before, and he has uh, declassified things, and they tended to actually hurt him more than they helped. Right. But, you know, he's not. That's one of the so. reasons nobody took Devin Nunes seriously, yes. even though they took him literally. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're not supposed to be doing this stuff, and that is itself a shanda it's a shame (laughs) it's a scandal but uh you know the fact that uh it turns out never to help him is pretty interesting yeah you know part of the reason and again i I talked about this a little bit on twitter there remains a reluctance especially in conservative circles and the post is one of them Mm -hmm. uh and even neutral media to consider the fact that trump is like guilty of everything we said he was and so when you go and approach this, it's like, well, how does it play? Well, how does it look if he's actually guilty and he's saying this stuff? That's really how you have to approach this. Not, well, he said, and then the other side said, what if he did these things? What if he did these things and he's selectively using the Justice Department, FISA warrants, and other things to make his case? That's bad. That is bad. Well, I mean, and it used to be bad. That's how we have to look at it. Do we have to? I mean, yeah. can we force that? It's, author- it's authoritarian stuff. Well, we can't force the media to take that approach, but we can take that approach. Okay. And just because we're partisans doesn't mean we're wrong. Uh, that's you true. You can even do it as a, well, on the other hand, if you want to add it that. That's right. You got it's a both sides it. story. <laughs> yeah, we have to be in the both sides story. Exactly right. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for Kago in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of Kago in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching Kegro X or David Waldman or Kegro in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Roots Radio. Just uh, reading in the background here, trying to figure out what uh, exactly Cohen is up to, but uh, I think we got the gist of it, certainly. Like we'll scour it for details later on, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, the fact that it exists is there. So uh, in my uh, uh, remaining minutes, which I don't have many of, uh, I just want to cover some of the other stuff. You mentioned some of it. Uh, But, for example, we have here a little business, the American casualties of Trump's trade war. Tariffs on Chinese imports have endangered small businesses around the United States, a growing nightmare that critics say the president could have avoided. Don't forget, small business is a mainstay of Republican support, uh, for the most part. That is to say the business owners. Mm, Uh, And then we have uh, Ohio GM workers voted for Trump. Now they want him to step up. And they're talking about the union workers in Ohio about the GM's Lordstown factory closing. Uh, And guess what? They're not happy. They're not. Why is that? They don't have to work. Because they felt Trump promised he was going to do some magic. Ah. He said, don't sell your house because the jobs are coming back. Ooh, hey, you know, as a financial advisor, that's bad news. Asked whether he thinks Trump will deliver on his vow to keep the plant open, David Green, president of UAW Local 1112 in Lordstown, was blunt. Your guess is as good as mine. So far, I haven't been real hopeful the president's going to have a desire or an ability to make changes in this area. 
William Binning, a former Republican Party chairman in Mahoning County and an emeritus, mm-hmm. emeritus uh, political science professor at Youngstown State University, said Trump's re-election bid in Ohio would take a hit. If the Lordstown oh. plan closes and nothing replaces it, I don't see politically how he could come back here and face these people and say, vote for me. <laughs> you don't see that, though? Yeah, mm-hmm. I see it. He can go back there and say, vote for me. <laughs> That's because, right. Uh, Hillary Clinton would have closed nine factories. Right. Or it didn't close. Or yeah, you're still that working. One. You still have a job. Right. You still have a paycheck. Who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? That's right. You're you rich. You all of those things. You're a billionaire. You should vote for me. Yeah, yeah I saw a good tweet to dug up, I guess, uh, a, a quote from Trump last campaign swing through there. Uh, Brian Klass has his quote. It, and it's a quote from start to finish. If I'm elected, you won't lose one plant. You'll have plants coming into this country. You're going to have jobs again. You won't lose one plant. I promise you. I promise you. Whoops. Well, all right. He's a big, mm. dumb liar. Right. Uh, you know, uh, this is Armando. Uh oh. says, you know, if Trump really wanted to save the plants, he would ask GM what it would take to keep them there, which is kind of a good point. Is he negotiating with GM? Is he talking mm. to them? I know he just uh, yelled at them and made their stocks drop. But what's he actually doing? He's making great deals, I right. guess. That's what he uh, does. Anyway, um, so uh, I, I, huh. it's an interesting approach. And, and yeah, uh, a you know, a lot of people are writing off Ohio as being uh, red and forget about it. But, you know, if you have a recession, I wouldn't uh, be so quick about that. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that comes up that uh, kind of exposes Trump's, you know, it's all talk, no action and not very good talk at that. Yeah, insulting people words. isn't necessarily a good uh, policy prescription, is what not I'm trying to say. Good, not good. All right, the uh, New York Times has the breaking story: Deutsche Bank offices are searched in money laundering investigation. 170 officers, <clears throat> excuse me, searched the headquarters of Deutsche Bank in Frankfurt hmm. and five other sites in the area early Thursday as part of a money laundering investigation involving hundreds of millions of euros. Prosecutors no. said no. two employees who were not publicly identified, but whose ages were given as 50 and 46 what? and other identif- unidentified people in positions of authority are suspected of failing to report possible money laundering for transaction worth more than three hundred fifty million dollars. This flowed to organizations in the British Virgin Islands before spring 2016. The German bank confirmed in a statement the police were investigating several of its offices in Germany and said the investigation related to the Panama Papers, which was a trove of files that put a spotlight on global money laundering. Yes. We are cooperating fully with the authorities, which is expected. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, that's what a bank what, would what say. Does it mean? I don't know, we'll see. So that's what's going on with Deutsche Bank, and that was breaking. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of business news, Not a lot of it not so good for Donald Trump. So he's getting hammered on a lot of different fronts. Business isn't necessarily going his way. Uh, the Fed isn't cooperating and doing what he wants by keeping interest rates low. They seem to be, dare I say, it, independent, and he hates that. Huh. Uh, politics isn't necessarily going his way. He just got clobbered in an election. The, uh, the difference between the Democratic vote and the Republican vote was historically high. Of course, the country's bigger than it used to be. But it's the biggest margin ever. Uh, and we got the new class coming in. And Nancy Pelosi won her uh, speaker caucus nomination, I guess is what you call it. And then the actual vote will be, what, January 3rd? Uh, yes, that will be the floor vote. And so a lot of this. And then uh, we have all of this uh, Mueller stuff from England and from the U.S. coming up. So it's really not been a, a good week for Donald. And when he's under pressure... Uh, he lashes out and does stuff, and so it'll be interesting to see. Yes. Now, yes. Uh, is Mueller's job safe? I don't think so, but what he'll do about it remains to be seen. Okay. Let's find out. Right. I'm just going to give you one uh, follow-up thing here, and this is uh, a query I put out oh. to a Republican I know in Virginia named Brian Shoneman. Okay. Now, Brian, uh, a few years back, was involved in a very close recount, and he was one of those like uh, fair-minded Republicans who was very uh, transparent about everything that was happening in the recount, was on Twitter talking about this is what we do, this is the time we're going to meet, this is how it works, this is the process. It was great. 
And right. uh, I'm not endorsing him for president, but I asked him. I sent the Washington Post story about what's going on in North Carolina 9. Hmm, yeah. And said, as a good faith expert, what do you make of this? And he said, it's interesting. I'm reading from his tweet that he just sent back. It doesn't seem to indicate there were votes stolen, just folks filling out forms they didn't need to. It's odd. It's common for aggressive campaigns to do a lot of uh, absentee ballot chase like this, but not with large numbers of folks not returning ballots. Hmm. So there's something to be investigated there. Something's not quite right. So I just leave you with that. And, of course, as we get more, we'll report on it. Okay. It's gonna be, that's going to be a very interesting one. Yeah. And, right. uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a process story. It's going to be a politics story. It's going to be a, uh, maybe even a, a criminal investigation story. Who knows? We'll see. But uh, that's our wrap up for today. And it uh, looks like there'll be more coming down, I would think, from the Mueller stuff, if not today, then tomorrow. I think this so. This is Greg Dworkin speaking with my good friend David Waldman Kegro in the morning. We've been blogging together for like over a decade. Yeah. Which Along with Armando and, and uh, Joan and other friends of the show, as we talked about. Uh, keep an eye on Marcy, though. She's got a pretty good eye for what's going on with the, the big picture Mueller stuff. Right. And uh, we'll be back, and uh, I'll, we'll talk to you on Monday. Okay. I think that sounds like a good plan. I'll try yeah, and come back. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, well, by the way, uh, just I'll, I'll tip you off on this one. Yes. John Dean is tweeting uh, with respect to Trump's latest threat pointing out this is a pure bluff by trump and shows how he doesn't understand that he can't declassify for example although you never know what it means but he can't declassify for example grand jury testimony or court sealed documents so uh apparently that uh numbered among the the threats of things that he would declassify things that are not necessarily in his power to declassify though i suppose he could try and uh, arrange anything and force people into doing things that they're not supposed to be able to do, and then, whoops, they're done. And now what are we going to do? So I, I don't know whether that really... I, I don't know what, what it makes any sense to discuss what the rules are when it comes to Trump. Yeah, uh, that's true. But, you know, I don't okay. think the Senate has been as compliant as the House has been. But mm-hmm. then again, they're still a lame duck. And yeah. Devin Nunes is still chair until you get the new Congress. Right. So what his committee can subpoena and then leak, I don't know. True also. And he's been willing to do that. So. And he has been willing to do that. I just wonder if he's going to turn that up in a week or two. He has left. They don't have that much time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Everybody breaks people. for the holidays and it's already like already almost December. And Trump's almost ready to go back to Mar-a-Lago anyway. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, so we'll see. Exactly right. Take care and I'll talk very to you good. on Monday. All right. Thanks very much. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. What we'll see. Okay. Very good. All right. Here we go. Let's see. A couple other things uh, to follow up on. We're just going to have to grasp at every little thing that comes across the transom at this point. There's just too much going on here. Uh, let's see. First of all, Michael Musson explains how, uh, how how they'll resolve the Ohio issue. Trump asked GM if they were closing plants, and GM denied it very forcefully. So it wasn't that he was lying. It was just, uh, you know, I, I, that's that's what they told me. What am I going to do? They give me a lot of money. What should I do? Not like them? I don't think so. All right. Uh, many, many things happening. Trying to decide as we speak where we'll go with this one. Should I just, uh, can I take a look at this? Is this brand new happening right now? Yeah. Uh, get a little information on the Michael Cohen bit here uh why boing boing should be my source for this i don't know but what the hell let's try it it's fun michael cohen pleads guilty to lying to congress okay so we had that right about russia trump real estate project i'm curious does he make any explanation as to why he lied i mean we can all guess why he lied i'm just wondering whether they just say that outright here uh this is uh boing boing's uh chief here right zenny hardine jardine how does she say it I don't know. But anyway, uh, she's one of the top folks, if not the top person, as I I think, right? At Boing Boing, doesn't she run the place? Anyway, it's getting hot in here. Donald Trump's former personal attorney, maybe, Michael Cohen has secured a new plea deal with Robert Mueller. Cohen is in court today pleading guilty, like for the second time, right? For lying to Congress in the Trump-Russia investigation. New in today's reporting, CNN reports that she's doing a good roundup here. 
CNN's got this one. According to the info being read out, Cohen made a false statement regarding Trump Tower deal in Moscow that he was working on in 2015 and 16. He had discussion about the project even later. Ah, okay. That's what, okay. I thought I saw some uh, other commentary about that one. Cohen previously said the deal was stopped in January 2016. ABC News earlier this morning has this bit. Cohen is scheduled to appear in federal court in Manhattan Thursday. That's right now, of course. Expected to enter this guilty plea for misstatements to Congress. Misstatements. In closed-door testimony last year about his contacts with Russians during the campaign. Once among the president's most loyal and zealous defenders in business and politics, Cohen has now promised to, quote, put family and country first, what do you know, by cooperating with prosecutors. Uh, becoming perhaps the most pivotal public witness against his former boss, yada, yada. Cohen's earlier plea deal with federal prosecutors in the Southern District of New York implicated President Trump in campaign finance felonies. Since then, the 70 hours of interviews that were mentioned earlier, the questioning is focused on contacts with Russians by Trump associates during the campaign, Trump's business ties to Russia. I have no business ties to Russia. You remember that. Obstruction of justice and... That's a good one. Talk of possible pardons. Sources familiar with the discussions have told ABC News. Renato Mariotti tweeting here and getting included in this story. Uh, this was solely a real estate deal and nothing more. Was that the lie? If so, what more was there to the deal? That's interesting. Uh, hmm. All right. So uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, oh, and here's a question, another uh, embedded tweet. Will we finally learn whether Michael Cohen has ever been to Prague? I thought that had actually been established since his claims that they actually did have evidence of him in being in Prague. But uh, let's find out. Hmm. So what else? Any of these other uh, embedded tweets give me anything to go on here? Uh, oh, but no, but reference to the Deutsche Bank. Thing here and uh, Brian Schatz, Senator from Hawaii, tweeting: No person holding any office of profit or trust under the United States shall, without the consent of Congress, accept any present emolument, office, or title, or of any kind whatsoever from any king, prince, or foreign state. The emoluments clause, the foreign emoluments clause. Um, not that Schatz alone, or even all Democrats by themselves, are able to do anything about that, but. A good reminder of uh, where we stand. Okay, let's see. Other issues percolating uh, that deserve time. I have a few here that don't deserve time. That's definitely true. Um, hmm, where we are. Uh, okay, let's see. And where are we uh, time-wise? 9.44? Okay, let's try this. Let's go back to the top of the show to the uh, caucus elections, <clears throat> Nancy Pelosi winning significant uh, with a significant margin, a tremendous margin, and, and, and great catch there by David. I had that one tucked away, too, that they just crap on her result and laud uh, Paul Ryan's results, though, of course, he was considerably less effective than she was, and... He had the Senate on his side too, and uh, but and, and so he also managed, uh, or, or somehow put together a worse margin inside of his own conference. But anyway, uh, Pelosi appears to have won the nomination rights. So uh, the question of whether or not there will be votes on the floor, that if, I guess basically the reporters were trying to keep the controversy going by saying thirty something votes. Uh, against Pelosi, uh, for lack of a better term, they, they would have been voting for people inside the conference. It's not a yes-no thing, I don't think, inside the conference. So I guess if 30-something people voted for someone else, um, what they were trying to do is say, oh, well, those people who voted for someone else inside of the caucus will be consistent and on the floor vote for someone else as well. And that's not necessarily the case. This is to be thought of as a primary and having lost in whatever uh, bids such as they might have been uh, to, to replace her uh, as, the, as the Democratic nominee for Speaker of the House, most Democrats 
will in the end say that's what we'll do we will maintain control of the house by voting for the person who won the nomination nancy pelosi though i guess there's you know i mean anything can happen so i guess that's what they were latching on to and saying well they only need uh, 17 members to vote for someone else to deny her a majority outright and here 30 something 34 was that the number have done it and so you know half that number if half of them come back it's still a problem so i guess that's what they're clinging to to continue with the issue steny hoyer uh also nominated again and and uh, because the um the the majority leader position is is simply decide it's not a constitutional position it's a caucus position and so that's decided they're done by with that and by the way he was re-elected by acclamation there was a unanimous it was basically a unanimous consent uh, analog so he'll be back no change there Clyburn returns as well the number four post was open because Joe Crowley who previously occupied the position of Democratic caucus chair, the person who runs the meetings, uh, well, lots of things happen in there. But for instance, yesterday, what was happening is these elections, he would have been in charge of running that meeting and he runs all their policy meetings when they get together and discuss uh, strategy and policy, except he won't be doing that anymore because he lost in the primary to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And you know how it is when you lose in a primary in the Democratic Party, right? Everyone gets behind the nominee because that's what parties are about. Anyway, uh, he's gone and they needed a new caucus chair. Now, uh, Armando would like, I, I say, let's give you the, we'll give you the green light there if you wanted to, he wanted to talk about uh, freshmen joining the Blue Dog Caucus. It's sort of an important development. We'll check in on that as well. Though there are other subjects to be sure. So maybe we'll keep a, a, a lid on how long we'll spend on the internal caucus stuff and get to the external things like constitutional crises. But OK, so there was a contest for caucus chair and the main contestants and maybe the only two contestants that I the only people I saw talked about were Barbara Lee of California, who is a deservedly a big uh, liberal progressive hero and Hakeem Jeffries, who is, I don't think, generally considered a progressive hero of any kind, but is a, you know a, another of our Democratic up-and-comers who wanted to move into leadership and uh, and did. There was, so that was the contest. Uh, Hakeem Jeffries is what? In his second, third term, perhaps? I better look that up. Uh, he's relatively new. Barbara Lee has been there since forever, and I think probably the, the thing that comes to mind most quickly with Barbara Lee is her sole dissenting vote, or her vote was the sole dissent, uh, in the um, uh, authorization for use of military force. So, okay, Armando tells me he's in his fourth term, Hakeem Jeffries. I've lost track because uh, cause I don't care anymore. How's that? Uh, but yeah, it's difficult to keep track of all these guys. Barbara Lee has been there since the 80s, I'm guessing. Let's see. But anyway, uh, she's well regarded, revered, really, among a certain part of the the caucus for that dissenting vote, the one and only vote against the authorization for use of military forces, prescient, of course, because the AUMF is, it was, even then, a piece of garbage that's been used improperly for everything else. Lee has been in since 1998, which is not really forever, but in political terms these days, it feels like it. So uh, basically, here's what I wanted to say about that one. Normally what we say is you can predict the outcome of these races by looking at the amount of money spent from out of the leadership packs affiliated with the contestants and that uh, the quick and dirty estimate if you have to do it on the fly is just show me the amount of money that they have dispersed to other candidates and we'll say like over the lifetime of the leadership pack 
which whenever there's an election going on where there's a question about, usually doesn't involve looking at more than hmm, six to eight years worth of uh, donations. But uh, it can become tedious. And so uh, your initial uh, glance at how those numbers run, and we can look them up while we're working on it. Let's see. Barbara Lee's leadership pack is um, One Voice. One Voice pack is the name of her leadership pack. And she's been running it for quite some time. She's been using it to collect and distribute campaign funds to other Democrats since the 2006 election cycle. So somewhere in the neighborhood of, so beginning in 2005, early 2005, taking in money, dispersing it uh, in the hopes of building a following in the caucus for elevating her to leadership. That's what they're about. I mean, it's not leadership packs. It does they're not called leadership packs because people in leadership have them. They do. But the there is a real answer to chicken and egg here. They're called leadership packs because they are used by people hoping to leverage the distribution of campaign funds, excess campaign funds in many cases to other members to get them to support them for moves into leadership. Now, Hakeem Jeffries has got one, too, and he's only been around for, what do we say, four terms? Hakeem Jeffries, let's look it up while we're going along, uh, leadership pack. His leadership pack is, where are we? Uh, Jobs, Education, and Families First pack. The, The pack names tend to be a little, you know, doofy sounding. Occasionally you get people who try to spell out their own name, you know, (laughs) with an acronym. Anyway, these are not terrible as these things go. One Voice Pack, Barbara Lee, Jobs, Education, and Families First. I love jobs and education and families. I'd put them first too. That's Hakeem Jeffries. Hakeem Jeffries has only been operative in this game since 2016, the 2016 election cycle. And... It was pretty anemic in 2016, rather robust in 2018. And so you could perhaps handicap things by saying, all right, well, lifetime, it certainly looks like Barbara Lee has given out considerably more money for considerably longer, a considerably longer amount of time. So the quick and dirty estimation is Barbara Lee wins that seat. Uh, Spoiler alert, she did not win that seat. Hakeem Jeffries did. So what happened to the analysis, right? Does it fail? Is this the first time that it's failed? And and what does it mean that it failed? Because I've always held out to you that the money is the best predictor. I don't know that it's necessarily the determining factor in the minds of like when decisions are made. Like I don't really care who occupies this otherwise important position. After all, uh, you know, it'll have some policy implications. I don't care about their ideology. I only care whether they gave me money or not. That's awfully hard to imagine every member of the ca- the caucus using as their decision making mechanism. So I have only offered it as a predictive measure. But I do think that there are some people who do that. I was other there are certainly members who say, as between these two, I don't care, and uh, I like the one that likes me. Like Donald and Donald Trump terms, I like the one that gives me money, but I, I, I don't know that I really believe that's how all the votes are cast. But it is the best predictor, and that's all. And I believe I'm am perfectly fine with the idea of making these contests ideological. Maybe they should be. Uh, it might be a good idea. Uh, and a lot of people who wish they were ideological are often very angry with me for pointing out that well. This may not be why they're making this decision, but money seems to determine the outcome with almost 100% accuracy. But what about this, right? If it was not the money and it was ideology, should we be worried about the direction that the conference or the caucus is taking, given that Barbara Lee, who's like the big progressive hero, didn't win versus Hakeem Jeffries? And she's a woman, and wouldn't it be great to have more women in high-ranking leadership, that's something. 
Uh, at least they're both people of color. You could cling to that if you wanted to. Armando wants to chime in on this one, and we'll let you do it. But let me uh, let me get through the rest of this quickie. Yeah, no, he's quick finished that, but I do have a comment on uh, Jeffries versus Lick. Okay, well then we can figure out the the ideology later. But anyway, so uh, you might say, I all right. I think that factored in. I do think that factored I think in. it has to. I mean, I, I really, I have, I, I, I cling to the model only because it works as a predictive model. I don't like it, and I wouldn't want to cast my vote that way. Uh, anyway, so but here, what what happened? Uh, Lee has given out more money for more years than Hakeem Jeffries by far. Why didn't she win if the money is the predictor? Well, OK, that's the that's the quick and dirty predictor. If you have to do it on the fly, just look at the numbers. But it doesn't make any sense to have that be the end of it. For instance, what if you gave out one hundred million dollars all to people who lost their races? Would you be able to expect that you should win? And the answer is no. So I did a little looking, and guess what? Uh, First of all, you might decide to handicap by weighting the most recent money most heavily. That's possible. Um, So in the 2018 election cycle, for instance, this one here, Hakeem Jeffries' PAC dispersed about, uh, it looks like uh, in the neighborhood of 200, 220 thousand dollars and pretty much the same go oh well actually less than half that as it now appears a hundred thousand dollars from barbara lee but like we said over the lifetime of the pack she's given out considerably more money but i actually went and looked at the recipients and i marked down how many of the people that she's given money to versus the people that jeffries has given money to are, are now present in the caucus to cast a vote and the answer is, uh, this time around, Barbara Lee supported 14 members who were there to cast a vote. Hakeem Jeffries supported 17. Okay, that's pretty close. But three of them are on both lists, and Jeffries doubled his money to those the, versus Lee. So in, in at net, she has 11, and he had 20. I thought that was pretty interesting. We'll continue with it after the break. Welcome back now to the Kego in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Armando joining us for more of the discussion. Uh, and we, we talked a little bit uh, in the background. Uh, I I think, all right, well, I'll let you go where you're going. You were going to mention. Okay. Let me, let me ex- actually connect this blue drug thing to the story. Oh, okay. All right, because I think it's relevant. Um, I, th- I think I sent you the link. I think it's seven new members oh, yes. of the Blue Dog Caucus, freshmen. Okay. Right? Now. We talked about this the other day about freshmen being joiners, but why would you join the Blue Dog Caucus? Uh, what are you trying to it's say? Famous. Well, it's infamous now. Yes, uh, with Democrats. That's, I mean, it's not true. a. I mean, ben McAdams in Utah, I guess. You know, maybe a couple of others are the type of districts where maybe it helps, maybe it uh. doesn't. But it, you can't tell me that it actually makes much sense. For most, because it's a dirty word for people who actually know what the Blue Dog Caucus is. You're telling me a swing voter in a Republican district knows what the Blue mm. Dog Caucus is? I don't buy it. Um, maybe it it's maybe an audience of media for the media type thing. The show, look at me, I'm a Blue Dog. But, uh, you know, in terms of fundraising and grassroots organizing and on- online fundraising, mm. it's negative. I had this dispute with Bill Sher yesterday, and I was like, "Tell me what's the political upside to joining the Blue Dog Caucus at this point for mm. most?" And I don't think there is any. Now, let me get you back to how that connects to Barbara Lee. Barbara Lee is a strong, progressive voice. You say, "Yeah, a lot of people admire her for voting against say UMF." Yeah, I completely agree and she got 113 votes in this now it wasn't a wipeout she lost by 10 votes it was very it, close it, the money she would have five told you votes that. and she wins yes uh i so hope it wasn't it three was, of them here of a, I guess if anybody knows how uh i'd be curious to know how tom malinowski uh joe morell and stephanie murphy voted well I, i'm sure minute. murphy voted for jeffries uh 
you know, Spanberger. And the mm-hmm. seven who joined the Blue Dog Caucus almost certainly voted for Jeffries. And one of the reasons is he have that vote on the AUMF. And mm-hmm. yeah. Lee has taken fairly leftish and, in my view, wrongheaded positions on Venezuela and Cuba and certain things like that. No. Okay. Uh, you know, she's toned it down a lot. This was a long time ago. Remember, she inherited Ron Dellums' seat. Yeah. She was a longtime staffer for Ron Dellums, who Ron Dellums, the people of the younger generation won't remember, but he was, you know, very in a time when there weren't that many. He was very, you know, you know, uh, for the Sandinistas and stuff like that, which I'm a totally against. But Ron Dellums was a great man. I mean, I, mm-hmm. just because he was really wrong on these things, because he didn't know about them in my in the way I think he should have doesn't mean he wasn't great and Bar- barbara lee when you take the total picture is one of the great congresswomen in terms of her positions i mean i it, it, in my view and, and i disagree with a lot of them but um, you put her in the leadership position and you say look i'm telling you barbara lee and i would have been fine with it because they're going to do it to hakeem jeffries so it doesn't mm-hmm. matter but hakeem jeffries is more you know he worked at paul weiss you know, I, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've seen him on TV. He's very effective. He uh, he and he hasn't taken. He didn't vote against the AUMF, and it you know he there. hasn't taken positions that are viewed as way left. Okay, he's like, but he actually is way left. But he doesn't okay. on those. Maybe that's good. Those signaling votes. That isn't how he portrays himself. You okay. know what I mean? Yes. So I think that ideology at least as perceived in the in the media and things like that is why jeffries was able to squeak by i also think Mm -hmm. that you know he probably split the congressional black caucus vote yeah i don't know that any other candidate would have been able to split the congressional black caucus vote and lee would have won she saw perceived him as soon as he joined in the races a major threat and she ran hard against him and I wish she would have won. Uh, I really do think that 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 would have been an important face to have in leadership, not just because she's an African American woman, but because of her ideology. Yeah, I think you. I, one of the things that I think about the Democratic Party that people on both sides are always trying to stamp out one side or the other, but by necessity we have to be a bigger tent, uh, you know, and and not become Republican like. In that, and then of course I want to go to a vote, and when, and this is where I have huge problems with the problem solvers, and the <laughs> Seth Moltons of the world. Yes. When you lose in the party, you say congratulations. I support you. Yes, Barbara Lee did. As Barbara Lee did, congratulations. I support you because that's how a political party has to work. And then the next time you take another shot, maybe you win, and they have to say congratulations. I support you. Yes. They're supposed to. They're supposed to. So that's that's the biggest problem I have. They they, they want all of it. And they obviously not going to get anything of it. It seems to me I think you're down to three no votes for against Pelosi in January myself. Mm-hmm. You notice how it all just went quiet today. Yeah. You know, Kathleen Rice made a ridiculous statement. And uh, off we go. But, I mean, money obviously has a lot to do with these votes. There's no question. Steny Hoyer gets voted by acclamation. Why? Mm, Steny Hoyer, of all people, who, by the way, is extremely to the right of his district. Yes. voting. His ideology is out of step with his district. And, frankly, it's out of step with the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. There are so many good reasons why Steny Hoyer should not be the majority leader he doesn't represent a significant constituency anymore hmm. except yeah. what does steady hoyer do oh. he raises tons of money yeah. that right. he hands out yes I, I, and i gotta say i mean it's it is a, it's a very weird thing and i'm not really sure how to classify it except to simply say you really have to it has to be like content neutral when I say I, I don't know why the money pred- I do know why the money predicts it, but, but and it shouldn't, and that's not what people are doing. But I I I, I don't know. I can't tell you exactly uh, why it predicts things because I'm sure, like you say, people vote if not ideologically, then certainly strategically, and say, 
you know, I think this is the person we should have out front. I don't necessarily agree with them all the time. Um, and yet the money uh, the, the, in total predicts what's going to happen. It doesn't necessarily predict individual votes. I mean, I can just because you mentioned Kathleen Rice, I can tell you that uh, uh, the only only one of the two candidates to donate to, to Rice was Lee in, in 2016. I, I I would be shocked if she voted for Lee for, I would for the be leadership position. Very shocked, and I, I I like you said like with Murphy. I doubt very much. It's the damnedest thing. I would bet that it's probably a terrible predictor of the individual votes. Yes, but is the almost perfect predictor of the aggregate votes, and I'm not sure why that is. Well, I, I think there's two ways of looking at it. Lee, I'm sure. Uh, Helped other people with with, with this idea in mind, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. Certainly, since Crowley uh, lost, and everybody knew that fairly important position was coming open. Yes. Uh, remember, the top three are in their seventies. There's yes. going to be a new well, speaker of the, of the house things. that's a Democrat, you know, in ten years or something. Yeah. Uh, no matter what, um, and the person most prime to do will be a younger generation purpose. I mean, I think Steny Hoyer's chance to be speaker is unless, you know, yeah. the Prince Charles he leaves house. immediately is not going to happen. Same right. with Clyburn. You go and hang so out with next, Prince Charles. Right. Well, Hakeem Jeffries is now positioned to be the front runner to be the next person to be uh, speaker of the house. That's a Democrat after Nancy Pelosi. So it was an important, uh, election, and I think that might have also gotten these people some of the willies because of Barbara Lee's, you know, sometimes symbolic positions that they don't like. It's oh well, look, she'll be she'll become you know, whatever Oakland's you know whatever. I don't know if, if people take Oakland. They probably still call her San Francisco, even though she's from Oakland. Hmm. Uh, and I think ideology actually determined that. I, I think. Jeffries did enough in terms of money so he could count on support. And uh, crucially, as a as a tactic, he was I'm sure he was able to pick off a lot of uh, CBC votes, particularly in New York Mm -hmm. uh, and in the north, possibly and in the east. Uh, You know, it'd be great to get a a roll call so so we could actually sort of figure all that out. And I think that sort of what happened, it became. A race bigger than it was. Indeed, Jeffries didn't jump in until, you know, the last couple months uh, into the race. Uh, you know, he was like four or five months after Lee. Hmm. And I'm sure he had it on his mind, but I'm not, I, I'm fairly sure some people said, you should run because you're the guy who could beat her and we don't want her to be in the leadership. Could be. They, uh, this is all speculation on my part. I have done no reporting on it. Just telling <laughs> well, you how I read. Yeah. Well, it it it, it makes a certain amount of sense. I thought uh, also very interesting uh, was that you you brought up the fact that uh, Lee too is in her seventies. So it was really interesting to watch the dynamic. Sixty six, but she's old. Uh, older. Yeah. Oh, I thought she actually was. No, she's sixty six. Oh. Uh, all right. Well, uh, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, having I watched, think, you know what? I could be wrong. Oh, I'm making right. a Marsha Fudge. Marsha okay. Fudge is sixty six. So you know what? I should double well, check. Well, in that, that case, uh, we'll yeah, we'll check it out. And uh, let's see. Well, we'll do the Barbara Lee. Do, should we trust the Wikipedia? Why not? They yeah, I think they're right on the ages. They're, they're right. They were right on seventy two. Oh, so you were right, and I was wrong. I was thinking Marsha Fudge. So okay, my apologies. Well, to the audience. congratulations for knowing how old Marsha Fudge is offhand. That's well, good. It, it became a thing to me when yeah. Marsha Fudge was talking about being a speaker, yeah. and we need new young leaders. And right. like, well, you know, she's sixty-six. Right. I guess that's younger than seventy-eight, but it's not it exactly is. turning the page. Right. Neither would seventy-two be turning the page. I thought it no, was very it interesting not. that uh, I mean the the the, the Voices for we – well, there were, of course, two factions saying we need new younger leadership. There was a right faction and a left faction. Yes. Um, and uh, the left faction since – when 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 the question was Pelosi has since come around to saying, all right, to hell with that. We don't need that right now. The right faction never gave up on it yet. Meanwhile, uh, so maybe the, now they're happy at having Hakeem Jeffries. But for the left faction that wanted – younger people but then found themselves voting for lee 
because she has, after all, a very good record and voting ideologically and but then tossing aside the we need a younger, fresher face thing in there. And then the younger, fresher face won and they're they're mad about that. They're mad on the Internet about that. Uh, and and then, of course, it became uh, well, uh, it, it didn't work because she's a woman and he's a man and the man always wins. And I don't know whether that was it or not. I certainly the, it certainly was a bad look for us as yeah. a party that the man beat the woman for this uh, race. Yeah. So that was unfortunate. But uh, the, the money predictor wins out again. I mean, I guess I, I, I went ahead and I did this look. So if you just to consider the 2018 things, I mean, again, this really shouldn't tell you that much. 11 votes and 20 votes even totaled. That's not a very big chunk of right. – of the caucus. So that won't tell you much either. Uh, but then I figured, all right, well, she's been around since 2000. What do we say? 2012 since she's been giving money. So oh, you went back to 2002 because she's obviously been in Congress since 98. But yeah. Who but knows how much she was giving leadership, out. Then. Leadership pack uh, history was all I was looking at. But um, she also just happens to have terrible luck <laughs> I guess, although then you start to think of it, well, maybe it's not luck. Okay, she's not picking winners. She's spending a lot of money and they're not showing up in Congress. And that yeah. could either it could mean a couple of things. But one of the things it could mean is maybe her instincts aren't nearly as good. Or maybe her instincts are, in fact, ideological and those people aren't winning. But she also... It'd be uh, the, uh, the latter, in my yeah, view. She, she probably a, gave some progressive long shots a yeah, shot that's in, a, in a few races basically that they couldn't win. So, you know, Jeffries spent his money. He picked some losers. I, I don't know if we want to say that about people, but people, people who, who lost. lost in life. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but in many cases, they were similar to uh, Lee's picks. But uh, the 2016 cycle was like a straight disaster in terms of uh, placing people in the caucus that would, if they voted on the basis of money, would be there for Lee. I mean, her picks across the board of the people she picked that, that actually won and are still in Congress or still in the House anyway, uh, even there, a couple of those people ended up getting more money from Jeffries the following you know, twice as much from Jeffries the following cycle. I, I'm looking at, she must, let's see, how many people are on this list? Like 35 people that she gave money to in 2016. I don't think, I don't think 10 of them are in Congress. Oh. I mean, okay. but that's like, well, you know, we're talking about uh, $100,000 down the tubes. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. You know, but she's doing the things that you would want a progressive hero to do, to say, you know, hey, they're a long shot. They might not win, but I believe in them and I want them here. I'm going to put money into that. And then the money goes away. And it's sort of sad because, uh, you know, if the money predictor uh, is real and I still, you know, I mean, it works, but I don't know why, um, then you could test the hypothesis by saying, all right, well, we're going to pick a progressive leader and we're going to fill up that leadership pack, fill it with small dollar donors if you want, right. if you can, yeah. and say, uh, you know, you have a, a six to 10 year program of handing out money. It could be Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez if you want. Why not? She can raise money, hand that, that money out. her part. That would be smart. Yeah. And, and, and see what goes on. See what you can do with the money. And, uh, you know, if she I, can raise it from small dollars. She could, uh, yeah. I'm sure she could get $10 million to hand out for the next election. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sad. People don't like to say, Oh, you know, money in politics, et cetera. You shouldn't uh, rely on things that way, but if it's small dollar money, what do you, you know, that's a good thing. And, right. uh, uh, what could be better than saying I'm investing in the caucus I want to see in the next now, 10 years? Right. And, and I think that's an interesting point. Um, one of the attacks that was going against Jeffries from like a, Bernie's uh, former digital fundraiser and uh -huh. uh, now at the Intercept is, you know, Hakeem Jeffries only got 2% of his money from small dollar donors. Mm hmm. And the problem was Barbara Lee, who does rely more on small dollar donors, but yeah. was never one of those, you know, darlings. Unfortunately, she's more of an old school progressive. Yeah. 
you know, mm-hmm. uh, only got like 20% from small dollar donors, which, you know, okay, well, ooh, 80% of large dollar. It, it was silly. But beyond that, both of them, both of them are in districts that they can't lose. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, 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 they're fine. They're terrific. I love them. But neither one of them has been in a tough race and a uh, tough contest ever. Uh, so you can't like say, oh, well, look, they're beholden to their donors. They're really not. They're beholden whenever they were was when they first got there. Now they're beholden to nobody. I mean, no one's going to knock them out, I mm-hmm. don't think. I don't think they can be primary to be beaten in their districts. So, you know, who are they beholden to? The fact is, only if they're looking for other things. You know, Hakeem Jeffries is someone who can be speaker if he wants to stay in the House or who can run for statewide office in New York. He's Gonna, he's a rising star. Barbara Lee's 72. Her life's in the house. This was why, in many ways, I think even more reason why Barbara Lee should have been yeah. the choice. But be that as it may, we are where we are. Well, it is an interesting thing to, to think about. I mean, you could certainly run that experiment and say, let's see if the money predictor works if we consciously make it. Well, work for Steny Hoyer. Come on. Yeah. What other reason is right. it to vote for Steny Hoyer? I don't really know. And, uh, yeah, that seems to have worked. And so, I, you know, I believe it can. It would be a great experiment um, to, to do. But, uh, yeah, the uh, I, I guess, uh, I don't know. That, for some reason, it made a lot of people very upset <laughs> yesterday when I was discussing with people. They were mad about Barbara Lee having lost and – and you know, but I, you know, I, I didn't want it to degenerate I can't into say I'm mad. I mean, it's not like they picked no, wasn't you. Seth Moulton or something no. like that. But uh, yeah, I I felt like they were going to let this slide back into well, it's all rigged again. Oh, let's not talk about it. I mean, it is rigged. But the thing is, you could rig it, get some I money. Mean, it's not rigged in the sense that everybody had one vote and they voted. Yeah. How? Why they voted? You know, well, that's right. But you got to figure out. Well, yeah, that, and it was very. That close. would be the it key was to 10 it. Votes. I mean, it was a super close race. And the money told you that it should have been. You know, I one point I wanted to make was, you know, Barbara Lee probably was hurt by the size of the wave. Hmm. Yes. There, there are probably five or six votes that came in against her from that wave. Ah, that's true. Uh, that that might not otherwise have made it in a marginal district. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That's uh, that's true. Uh, but she had she had much better luck this time, and I think that the wave had to do with that too. Like the 2016 election wasn't particularly good for Democrats, generally speaking, and so she also did poorly. And then uh, wave year, everybody did well. You bet on the Democrat, you win a lot. Yeah, you you just you know uh, we won uh, whatever 55 percent of the races or whatever. But uh, yeah, the money thing is a big deal, and uh, and it also tend, it explains why our leadership tends to be less than uh, boldly progressive all the time. In that uh, you got to come from a you got to be a fundraiser. I, to a make leader that work. of you know there was actually a pretty interesting piece. Well, it was silly, and yet it, it, to me it, it raised some interesting questions by Matt Iglesias at Vox about Pelosi. And, you know, he said, yes, yeah, she's a fantastic speaker of the House for, the, for just about everything except one thing. She's not great on TV, which I happen to agree mm-hmm. with. I don't think she's great on TV. Okay. And not because she's a woman. She just doesn't, you know, she doesn't have – do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I guess, she, she's not I don't know punchy. If I, she doesn't. She's not a soundbite but... person. She's a serious person who yeah. thinks seriously about things. And um, and, and no, Dick Gephardt was terrible on TV. And he, you know, he was a leader. And <laughs> yes. my God, Tom Foley, forgot about Tip was a caricature. Tip O'Neill. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, so know. it's not like Speaker, Speaker isn't necessarily a great these... TV person ever. Even Paul and Ryan. They never really thought he was TV a genius. People. I mean, who who really knew about what the Think about it in the history. Denny Hastert was awesome on TV. He obviously <laughs> not. Some you know, shambling man really wasn't. Yeah. Meanwhile, the longest I mean, Paul Ryan, they Republican loved speaker. Him. He's a, you know, look how good he did. So how important mm-hmm. that was anyways is up to question. But if you cared about that stuff, this mm-hmm. is a, I'm going to lead you to a discussion that I'd actually would love to hear from you. And I'll probably hang up and listen as a first time caller uh, <laughs> is committee chairman mm-hmm. and the fact that when you hold the house the committee chairman become much more important tv personalities 
and frankly, much more important. And since you worked uh, uh, for years uh, in that and have followed it so closely, what is the power that a committee chairman has in the House to A, drive an agenda, B, get bills to the floor, C, get on TV and make cases? Uh, because it's look at our – there's two chairmen that I know of that I think are very good on TV and I think very good chairman and very good congressman. Uh, Adam Schiff, of course, that people probably know by now because he was going up against Nunes. And uh, Elijah Cummings. Mm-hmm. Jerry Nadler is an incredibly smart guy and I think will be a terrific committee chairman on the Judiciary Committee. I'm not sure he's mastered the television thing yet. Yeah, maybe not. What else? The appropriations. We were talking about Mirtha the other day, and you yes. talked about how important Mirtha, the power of Mirtha will, that's the Appropriations Committee chairman. Right. And my understanding is that we're going to have a an African-American woman who's going to be head of the Appropriations oh. Committee. Uh, I'm not sure who. I don't know. Someone just mentioned it, and I didn't oh. say the name. And I'm like, who's that going to be? Well, let's, let's is, look. Isn't that going to be a pretty important person? Yes. Ways and means or appropriations? appropriations? I mean, they're both important, but yes, okay. Who's going to be chairman of let's Ways and Means? Let's go see. I don't know. Well, let's go look up uh, who is the ranking member now. I mean, it'd be hard to bypass the ranking member, right? Typically, yes. Um, I, they, uh, unless there's a power play involved and they were on the wrong side. Yeah. I mean, it does sometimes happen. Let's see. The current uh, ranking member... Of appropriations is Nita Lowy, but oh, excuse me, as a woman, uh, not an African. Yeah, woman. yes, Nita Lowy, who, by the way, is probably going to retire from Congress pretty soon, or probably yeah. maybe not as soon as she would have <laughs> if right. we had won I this, guess, little, this election. Yeah. Although I'm looking at the old things here, and so I, I'm, I'm careful. I don't really know necessarily who did and didn't retire already. Well, not Nita always. did not. She okay. has, been talk about. She's talked about retire. There's been talk about her retiring for mm-hmm. years. By the way. To start a new controversy, the the rumor mill is, you know, if Chelsea Clinton would run for her seat. Oh, <laughs> okay. Fun, now, right? The uh, current, uh, the the pecking order, the the seniority order in which they're listed, and I think they're listed in seniority order here, usually what happens with the Democrats on the Appropriations Committee is uh, interesting. Nita Lowy, Marcy Kaptur would be a real oh. problematic I mean, she, I, I kind of like her in some ways, but not, uh, you know, I, I don't oh, want her don't, sitting in agendas. You don't agendas. have to apologize to me. I, I'm not a big Mercy Captain okay. fan. I don't like her on trade. And uh, obviously she yeah. was so, pretty bad on choice for a lot of years until I think she revised herself like Tim Ryan did. Ohio's weird that way. But so anyway. Lowy Captor, Pete Visklosky is the third Ooh. ranking. Peter Visklosky. From Indiana. I don't know who he is. Uh, and Jose Serrano is the fourth ranking Democrat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's like, you know what? I don't think I would put him in charge. I yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not thrilled with that. Rosa DeLauro right lineup. behind him. DeLauro, Rosa DeLauro. Okay. So I'm okay with uh, I'm okay with I her. Like Rosa DeLauro. Yeah, I don't think we'll go any further than five in terms of the ranking. Uh, they'll be it's taking be over Lowe some subcommittees. Group, presumably, there's nobody that you, unless Pelosi has something in mind there. I don't know. Subcommittee chairs. I mean, they, those five probably hold sub would hold subcommittee chairs in appropriations. So uh, that's something all by itself. We're going to start thinking about that, and 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 those decisions are not always made strictly on the basis of seniority though they do like to stick to that but then they the caucus yeah, they will make around. those decisions uh, I, I remember there being some move arounds and whatnot I, mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to tell you how you run your show but I know we're getting close to the break I think it would be nice for all of us to remind ourselves of, because now that we have the committees how, how they function in the house and how they lead to things, or does is it is it more of a top down operation than, than we're led to believe? Uh, does does the speaker and the lead and the leader sort of tell them, okay, do a bill about this, and then they go and do a bill about this, or do they come up and percolate their own bills? You know, interestingly, if you think about what the problem solvers caucuses are talking about. Um, this is their theory of what's wrong. Hey, you know, we get shut out and we don't get to move things and mm-hmm. our voices aren't being heard. We need to democratize small D the house 
is this, is this what they're talking about? The fact is, that's not what they're talking about, in my view, because if they were, they would have made an articulate case. This was all this was all grandstanding. I mean, this is what. Mm. By the way, they ended up making a deal. I, I, I yes. send you the link. Uh, I don't remember what the rules changes are, but I think they're all pretty cosmetic. Uh, well, we'll take a look at them. Maybe we can do that uh, with our time on Friday. But yeah, uh, well, I can speak to that certainly after the break in terms of the committee powers. But yeah, committee chairs pretty much still drive the agenda there. But uh, they do get suggestions all the time from the top. Don't always yes. take them. They don't have to take them. Yeah. Right. That's funny. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrox at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on At Roots Radio. And, uh, yeah, so I'm pondering things over the break, and uh, I don't know that I have much in the way of prepared material to actually answer the question of how much power committees have. It's just sort of, uh, well, it's something you got to feel your way through. I mean, committees are still awfully powerful, and committee chairs, of course, have a tremendous amount of discretion uh, about which bills which make their way to their committee they're going to spend time on and uh you know it, it's really i mean it's up to their discretion essentially they just uh, they have the uh, the power more or less unilaterally to schedule hearings which is still the typical way that a bill makes its way from you know the hopper to the floor uh by the way committee chairs also often weigh in on the question of whether or not a bill will come to their committee if they want it uh and they they can make the case that their committee ought to have jurisdiction if it's not entirely clear or they can make the case that they shouldn't have jurisdiction if they don't want it anywhere near them uh, so even the question of whether or not a bill lands on their lap uh, is is one that they can weigh in on. Once it gets there, if it's something they favor or are very interested in, you know, schedule hearings for it early, uh, you know, depend. And once uh, sometimes they have to give in to their constituent membership also. I mean, they, too, are leaders and elected to a certain extent uh, the the caucus and the Republican conference both internally uh, have mechanisms whereby they can, in fact, hold votes on whether or not some, you know, whether a, a particular member ought to be entrusted with the chairmanship. And they uh, technically are the ones deciding which members will be on the committee and, and how many and, and uh, in what order of seniority. Um, you know, it's a once they set it in motion and people are on committees, they tend to return to them. And the the conference and caucus are both, uh, generally speaking, loath to disrupt that. But it can happen if you, are, you know, if you make some sort of egregious violation against party discipline, they will disrupt those things. Uh, and sometimes uh, members with equal. Uh, seniority status both as members of the house and even on the committee will uh contest the chairmanship between them that happens too so uh, anyway but uh, you know so it's a significant amount of power that goes along with the position and the committee chairs similarly work along with the rest of the party leadership and uh, there's a balance there uh, in terms of who gets to call the shots and it depends on what committee it is. The more influential committees, I mean, that makes the chairs of those committees very powerful people. And of course that 
also, you know, that, that, that should also be expressed in terms of the amount of lobbyist money that flows their way. And in some of these uh, chairmanships that are very powerful and control a lot of money in the economy, ways and means, of course, being one of them because they're the tax writing committee, appropriations because they're the tax spending committee, uh, they, they attract a lot of donations. And by the way, what usually happens because of uh, limitations on how much PAC money can be spent on an individual member who is, let's say, an influential member of the committee or perhaps chair of the committee, uh, campaign finance law capping how much you can get, what uh, lobbyists having, in some cases, bottomless pockets. What do you do if you want to express even more support for somebody who's a friendly chair or who you wish was a friendly chair of a relevant committee? And the answer is, you say, why don't you start a leadership pack and I'll put excess funds in that and then you can pass that out and become more powerful. Or if you are, let's say, uh, the ranking member because you're in the minority, it looks like you might move into the majority sometime soon. Maybe you want to shore up your position. Perhaps there's somebody else on the committee with as much your uh, seniority as you and you might have to campaign to win the chairmanship when the House turns over. Here's some extra money. That's what that's kind of the way things work. As far as decisions about what bills should and shouldn't be moved or expedited, they like largely to leave that up to the committees. But when it doesn't look like it's going the way the leadership would like it to, they're usually on the same page, the party leadership and the and the uh, committee chairs. When they're not, and it's an important one, if it's a messaging bill and the and it's about taxes and the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee isn't cooperating yeah then you start to lean on them and you say well look we really need you to you wouldn't have chosen this bill necessarily to go first but we think you should and here's our reasons why and if that doesn't work you know you can suck it up or lean on them in other ways and say you know well uh, let's say for instance uh, that other thing that you wanted which isn't under the jurisdiction of your committee maybe that doesn't move Maybe it doesn't move as quickly. Maybe the appropriations committee uh, can be convinced not to agree with you necessarily on how much you're authorizing a billion dollars for this. Maybe appropriations only wants to put half a billion into the program. And then, of course, there are other committees like that are considered leadership committees, like the rules committee in the House is uh, traditionally considered to be controlled by the speaker and the high up leadership and they uh, very often consult very closely, let's say, with the Rules Committee chair about what sort of rule they'd like to see for every bill that's coming to the floor. For instance, we have a lot of members who need protection from tough votes on this one, and the Republicans are going to bring a gotcha amendment. Can we make sure that the rule doesn't include that amendment? Things like that. So, I mean, it's a pretty vague answer. But uh, like everything in coalition politics, there's some give and take from both sides. It generally flows uh, in the in the direction of uh, generally the direction of what happens inside of a committee starts with the chairman. That's they're meant to have some autonomy. That was a uh, that's something that has come over many years uh, and many reform fights. It used to be the case that it was controlled much more tightly by the speaker and the speaker could dictate this is what's going to happen inside this committee. And usually the committee chairs didn't object all that much because they were more or less ideologically on the same page. That's how they got to be there in the first place. They were henchmen and they didn't have that much autonomy to rebel. But uh, as uh, Greg was telling us about historically the other day, Joe Cannon, very powerful Republican speaker, uh, found himself uh, on the wrong end of a revolt by the committee chairs over things like that. And since since those days, increasingly the committees are uh, handled as autonomous uh, uh, entities. And it only comes up when top leadership disagrees with them and says, uh, you know, we're doing a messaging thing here and you got to bend a little bit. And you know, depending on what kind of leverage and what kind of things they're talking about, they do. They tend to bend. Because also, of course, you know, the, the, the check and balance here is the chair decides 
uh, which bills that come under its jurisdiction will have priority and uh, therefore be reported out and in what format they'll be reported out. But it's the majority leader who tend, uh, whose, whose job it is to schedule bills for floor action. So if you have a serious disagreement and a committee bill that uh, the chairman wants and the leadership doesn't and they report it out, the majority leader if he's on the same page as the speaker, will then tend to say, all right, you know, it might not come up all that quickly, or maybe it only comes up uh, next year, or maybe it comes up in conjunction with another bill and we combine the two of them. And the speaker and majority leader in tandem can speak to the rules committee. And, you know, even if, it, if you're finally forced to bring the thing to the floor, maybe it doesn't come to the floor with the rule that the committee chairman wanted. There's a lot of places to intervene and have those fights. All right. That's the process thing. That leaves us less time, uh, but we still have tomorrow, of course, to talk about some of the other things. And some of them are kind of crazy and we should get to. And uh, some of them you've already been talking about out there amongst yourselves, uh, probably on the ones on the Trump-Russia front and the Deutsche Bank front. But uh, other items that are going to require discussion are out there. One, uh, might as well make a, at least a quick um, note about this one. CNN reporting la uh, late last night uh, that the Trump administration was set to announce a bump stock ban after all this time. Remember, I think that uh, that one arose, or the, the idea of it arose from out of the Las Vegas shooting, which is now more than a year in the past. And we all figured that Donald Trump had either forgotten about that or was ducking it because uh, the NRA turned out to be, you know, angry and annoyed about the bump stock ban. I guess they I don't know whether it matters a whole lot, ultimately, because we've talked a bit about bump firing and bump stocks here. Bump stocks make it easier to bump fire a semi-automatic weapon with more precision, but Bump stocks are not the thing that makes it possible to fire a semi-automatic weapon as though it were a machine gun, as rapidly as if it was a machine gun. All semi-automatic weapons are capable of doing that without additional equipment, and that's not something that gun owners or gun enthusiasts or the NRA or anybody really wants you to know or think about, and so they'll focus on the bump stocks. And the bump stocks are a tremendous advantage. They make it very easy to do and to actually aim when you do it. And that's kind of important. Anyway, so here's the news. The Trump administration, according to CNN, plans to announce the long anticipated federal rule officially banning bump stocks in the coming days. And Trump did it Trump style, I think. He said, we're going to ban those things. And everybody thought, you know, he's going to run into problems with the NRA. He's going to have to back off. It doesn't work like that. But it looks like the rule he got is... Uh, like yeah, is very Trump-like in its drafting. Bump stocks gained national attention, the article continues, last year after a gunman in Las Vegas rigged his weapons with the devices to fire on concert goers, killing 58 people. Remember that? Wounding 600, right? President Donald Trump vowed to outlaw the devices soon after the tragedy, and some lawmakers on Capitol Hill urged him to back a permanent legislative fix. But Opposition from lawmakers and the National Rifle Association ultimately made a regulatory change, the only realistic path forward to accomplishing the president's goal. The devices make it easier to fire the rounds, uh, fire rounds from a semi-automatic weapon by harnessing the gun's recoil to bump the trigger faster, an operation that caused officials at the Bureau of Al Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives during the Obama administration to conclude that it's merely a gun accessory or firearm part and not subject to federal regulation. At Trump's direction, however, the Justice Department submitted a proposed final rule earlier this year that upended the Obama-era interpretation, and I think it's a good one, the, and concluded that bump fire stocks, slide fire devices, and devices with similar characteristics all fall within the prohibition on machine guns by allowing a shooter of a semi-automatic firearm to initiate a continuous firing cycle with a single pull of the trigger, and therefore they are illegal under federal law. I mean, that's surprisingly aggressive, in fact. I mean, I also think it's subject to 
challenge, and I don't know whether they really were counting on that or what, but this is it. Under the new rule, bump stock owners would be required to destroy or surrender the devices to authorities. That's like, wow. Okay. Members of the public will be given 90 days to turn in or otherwise discard their bump stocks, according to a source familiar with the final rule. Bump stocks turn semi-automatic guns into illegal machine guns. This final rule sends a clear message. Illegal guns have no place in a law and order society, and we will continue to vigorously enforce the law to keep these illegal weapons off the streets, says a senior Justice Department official. Uh, unnamed. Do you really have to do that anonymously? Republican lawmakers who are typically opposed to federal agencies writing regulations to accomplish what Congress hasn't directly legislated had insisted that the Justice Department and ATF write a new regulation. Whereas some Democrats, such as Dianne Feinstein of California, have repeatedly cautioned that such a ban would likely result in lawsuits given ATF's earlier interpretation. ATF acting director, did you know we were working with an acting director? Thomas Brandon acknowledged in a Senate hearing this summer that he has been advised that banning bump, st bump fire stocks through executive regulation could lead to court challenges that would delay the implementation of a ban. Trump said last month he told the NRA bump stocks are gone. But how the group responds to the final rule remains to be seen. Uh, well, you know, that's probably right. There'll probably be a big lawsuit. I don't know whether it's intentional that uh, Trump is going this route because he knows that uh, a lawsuit might be able to block it or set it back, but he wants to look like he's doing something, or whether he genuinely wants to, you know, get rid of them all. That's a very Trump-style thing to try to do. I guess I bring it up, uh, one, because it's interesting, and two, we'll have to keep an eye on it to see how quickly it's implemented and how quickly it's challenged. And three, to remind you that uh, for all the talk, the truth is that go ahead, ban every bump stock you can. Uh, Semi-automatic guns can be turned into illegal machine guns with your bare hands because guess what? They've fooled you for a hundred plus years. Semi-automatic weapons are basically automatic weapons and uh, they can all fire that way. And if you don't believe me, go to YouTube and search bump fire semi-automatic. Pick your favorite semi-automatic bump fire a Glock. Bump fire. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You don't even have to name one. And uh, YouTube is chock full of videos of people <clears throat> sometimes explaining how it's done, sometimes just doing it, but basically taking your run of the mill garden variety semi automatic pistol and firing it like a machine gun, emptying the clip, rat a tat tat, and uh, then going, woo, it's so cool. They're usually just shooting you know, into a ravine or something dumb like that. Uh, very rarely actually shooting at a target. It just seems to be something people out in the country like to do and they think it's fun. And the truth is any semi-automatic can do it and they think that's fun too. And, uh, you know, uh, the only difference is, uh, I guess if you're firing into a crowd of concert goers, it doesn't matter whether you have to aim or not. The, the bump stock makes it easier to aim and it makes it easier to do with longer and more accurate rifles than, uh, you know, as opposed to, to the handguns. But, uh, okay, there you have it. That's news. We'll watch how that one develops. Other probably more important news. How do we even want to deal with this? Do we have time to get through this? I, I, I'll just lay it out there because, I don't know, we'll have to deal with it tomorrow uh, anyway on Friday. Uh, Friday, I'm sure, we'll also spend some more time going over the Jeffrey Epstein uh, news, even though it's not news. I mean, I guess we don't have to go over it too much, but maybe some more developments once the story has had another day to percolate. But uh, I'm glad that I paid enough attention to have told you a long time ago that uh, Alex Acosta was going to get wrapped up in this thing and that Jeffrey Epstein was, well, I didn't have to tell you he was a scumbag. Oh, yes, right. The new revelations, though, about the terms of his imprisonment are rather shocking. And uh, maybe we can discuss that by tomorrow. But basically it was, you know, he, remember, he, he got busted on, you know, serial child molestation. And he ended up doing 13 months in jail. And then most of that wasn't even in the jail. First of all, it was in the county lockup. Second of all, he somehow managed to 
uh, arrange it that he would get a private wing of a county jail. No other prisoners in his wing. Eventually, he ended up hiring his own guards for, and was released six days a week for 12 hours a day on quote-unquote work release, even though Florida law apparently prohibits, I don't know if it's Florida law or county practice, but at any rate, he, as a sex offender, he should have been prohibited from eligibility, blocked from eligibility for work release. But they just said, eh, maybe he will have it anyway. So, you know, he's a billionaire. He bought himself a nice cushy office and he left jail 12 hours a day, six days a week and just went and luxuriated in his own office and then would go back and sleep in his private wing. It's really a tragic uh, situation. And just once again, uh, a crystalline uh, example of how there are separate justice systems for people with money. Um, But I got to plant a different seed Uh, in, in, in the middle of all the Trump Russia thing. Um, and I'll borrow here from Durati, who has a a uh, diary up at Daily Coast and has aggregated a tweet storm or two uh, of a very important story uh, entitled, uh, let's just read it. This is the, the diary titled, SCOTUS blogs Tom Goldstein's motion to install Rosenstein as attorney general. This is an interesting thing. I did not see the play coming. We've we've spoken uh, in the last couple of days about various legal maneuverings, people who are already in the middle of lawsuits against the Department of Justice and who have named the attorney general personally as a defendant, and they need to be able to know who to put on their suit instead of Jeff Sessions, who's now out. And they were using that as a platform to question whether or not Whitaker really was acting attorney general, whether he had been appointed legally or not, and whether uh, they could get a court to rule on it. But this apparently a, a, a lawsuit that simply goes straight at it and says, not only do I think Matt Whitaker ought not to be considered the acting attorney general, but the state of the law and the uh, intent of the founders essentially uh, basically tells us, no, we should we should go right to the conclusion that that Rod Rosenstein is acting attorney general and Matt Whitaker is not. So here's Durati's compilation of things here. He starts off with some notes up at the top that Thomas C. Goldstein, known simply as Tom Goldstein, is an American attorney known for his advocacy before and blogging about the Supreme Court. Over the past 15 years, Goldstein has served as one of the lawyers for one of the parties in just under 10% of the cases argued before the Supreme Court. How do you like that? And I don't know whether, uh, let's see. uh, All right. Uh, Okay. So now uh, turning to uh, the source for this material, jurist.org, we now have this excerpt in Durati's uh, diary here. Lawyer Tom Goldstein on Friday, so we missed it for some days, asked the U.S. Supreme Court to appoint Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein as the acting attorney general, replacing Matthew Whitaker. That would have, I guess, been last Friday, and we didn't know about it until it's almost Friday now. Goldstein claims that Whitaker was illegally installed, I I agree, as the temporary successor of former Attorney General Jeff Sessions, and that Rosenstein is the legal and constitutional successor to Sessions. The motion argues that as the Senate-confirmed Deputy Attorney General, Rosenstein automatically succeeded to the role of Acting Attorney General under 28 U.S. Code Section 508A and the Appointments Clause of Article 2 of the Constitution. The motion calls for the court to resolve this dispute immediately. The Attorney General has a number of responsibilities, including appointing immigration judges, determining whether to enforce federal statutes, and overseeing the investigation of special counsel Robert Mueller. Yes, one of the small duties that this person uh, will have. Now, key passages, I guess, from the filing itself, uh, and that's what's been getting passed around Twitter, uh, make a very forceful argument in a very brief amount of time here. 
Uh, it comes straight out, in case you were wondering if we were in a constitutional crisis here. This is a constitutional crisis. That's the key passage beginning here. It is a constitutional crisis, and uh, many of you will recognize it. I, that word was constitutional. I muddled it. It is a constitutional crisis, even if we are distracted from and dulled to it. We certainly have that problem. Article 2 of the Constitution requires that principal officers, including the Attorney General, be confirmed by the Senate. For the first time in a nation's history, the president has forced out a principal officer and replaced him with a non-confirmed appointee, indeed refusing to submit him or anyone else for confirmation. That's the key issue here. That hand-picked successor was best known for his views that the Department of Justice should limit or shut down an active criminal investigation into whether the president and his campaign colluded with a foreign power and obstructed justice. That's a bit of a new twist, too. That appointee now controls the investigation, and shouldn't, I would say. And I'm sure that's what he means. The president made the appointment in a fashion calculated to prevent the Constitution's enforcement because the special counsel leading the investigation is barred by law from raising the issue and because it will be mooted before any other case can reach the court. The president has gone well past disheartening tweets. This is a power grab. It is a power grab designed to protect the president personally by evading the authority and responsibility of the Senate and this court under the Constitution. Yes, the court can blink at that reality, decline to act and move on and say it's a political question, for instance, but history will regret that it did. The nation is thankful not merely for a judiciary that forcefully articulates its independence and neutrality, but even more so for one that adapts to the circumstances as required to protect our liberty by responding to assaults on the separation of powers. The motion presents a legal question that requires a ruling by this court. It is an epic interbranch conflict over the powers of each one. Checks and balances are everywhere. The president forced out a Senate-confirmed principal officer. He then issued an order personally selecting someone else who he refused to nominate. That order seeks to evade not only the Senate's right and obligation under Article 2 of the Constitution to decide whether to consent, but also an on-point statute enacted by Congress, the Attorney General Succession Act. Just as important, this question will probably evade this court's review forever if it doesn't act very soon. Yes, other challenges to the appointment are now being briefed in the lower courts, but even assuming the parties can establish standing, the issue is going to be mooted. Again, it is striking that the Solicitor General notes the pendency of that litigation, citing just a few of the examples, but never even obliquely suggests to the court that any of these cases will provide this court, the Supreme Court, with a vehicle to decide the issue. If he could have, he would have. And I guess he didn't. And so there you have it. Uh, that's what's circulating around. Did you, did you, uh, the full motion is available for you to view at the, uh, by uh, a link at the bottom of the, um, the diary, which, of course, we'll provide you uh, to look at by this afternoon. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he goes straight at it here and makes a very interesting, I mean, I'm, I'm not certain even in, in what capacity he has decided he can weigh in here, but I'm glad he's giving it a try. So... Yeah, uh, it is a constitutional crisis. We shouldn't be accepting. I'm glad that this has brought it to the fore. I'm hopeful. I well, I'm not hopeful. I wish that uh, reporters would take it seriously and just literally stop referring to Whitaker as the acting attorney general, or at least say only that he's the purported acting attorney general. I think he's made some serious points here. And uh, I'll be very interested to see whether they don't simply duck this thing i just i think that's sort of in their nature and uh that's kind of the direction that we're going to go uh, meanwhile uh, they make the very salient point in all of this that trump hasn't bothered to name a new attorney general so it's not a matter of well we need to have this guy as temporary acting attorney general pending 
the Senate's approval of someone else. I think it's very important, and, 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 might, and it might end up mooting part of the case if he were to simply say, all right, fine, I'm going to nominate somebody for attorney general. One of the dangers, though, in all of this is uh, in the uh, Epstein expose that everybody has been reading in the last day, it turns out that one of the people that was on, the, I guess, some you know, maybe fictional short list for the attorney general spot on a permanent basis would be Alex Acosta. I guess he's going to be off the list, but if he's not, another opportunity to talk that through. Maybe we'll dissect that story a little bit more tomorrow and uh, many other things that are still out there that we haven't had a chance to bring you. But of course, as always, we are followed by the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Time now for Justice Putnam to pick up the slack on things we may have missed. Let's see what he's got here. Oh, a former Fox News pundit ripped into Trump for his ignorance of world affairs, his neglect of the Ukraine situation, and his special relationship with Putin. And I think they are set to meet in the From next Daily couple Coast of days. From Daily Coast Radio, aren't they? on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Here's some more from L.A. A sudden purge. Numerous top L.A. County sheriff officials will be fired or relieved of duty once Alex Villanueva is sworn in as the new sheriff. And a Project Veritas-linked operative tried to use Sierra Club credentials to access Democratic campaigns. Wow, still going on, eh? We'll be back tomorrow.